Hello, and welcome to U University. I'm Dr. Kelly. This episode represents the beginning of a new U University video series. I originally started U University three and a half years ago as an audio podcast, and then in 2015, 2016, I did weekly live broadcasts on Periscope called U University Live. And both of those formats were awesome, and I ultimately decided to bring the show into a video format. So here I am, I'm back. <laughs> and thank you so much for all of your encouragement and support in resuming U University. As a little background about the show, the idea for U University started with an honor seminar in knitting that I taught for a number of years at the university where I work as a psychology professor. In this class, yes, the students learned how to knit, but more than that, each week we talked about how knitting is related to a wide variety of academic disciplines like neuroscience, economics, feminism, and psychology. As I would tell my knitting friends about this class, every single one of them said the same thing. Boy, would I love to sit in on that class. And I used to think, wow, if I let everyone sit in on the class, I'd have to teach it in this huge lecture hall. So then in 2013, I went on sabbatical and I thought, this might be a great time to bring this idea to a podcast. So instead of all my knitting friends sitting in a big lecture hall, um, they could listen to the podcast. So that's how U University was born. And it really just took off from there it grew to well beyond my local knitting friends to people around the world who simply enjoy learning and enjoy the fiber arts. A little bit about myself. Um, my mom taught me how to knit when I was a teenager. Um, I didn't really become enthusiastic about it until about 10 years ago. I was having a particularly stressful semester and thought it would be good to have a hobby that was relaxing. And it happens that at the time I was reading Debbie Maycomer's book, A Good Yarn, which is about uh, a group of women who meet at a yarn shop knitting group. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to have a peaceful hobby and a group of friends like that? So I picked up knitting again and set out to create a knitting community around myself. Now, in order to do that, I taught a lot of people how to knit. In 2008, I joined Ravelry, and I actually found some knitters local to me. And we ended up starting a few different knitting groups. Um, I started teaching my knitting class at the university. So within about three years, I had a whole new set of friends who were knitters. And then I started spinning. In the beginning, I was using drop spindles, and eventually I bought a spinning wheel. Uh, my spinning wheel is an Ashford traditional, and I love it. Um, I don't spin much lately, but I'll get back to it. So here we are into 2017 already. Happy New Year to you all. Um, I don't do New Year's resolutions or really set specific goals for the new year. I find that they don't usually work out, and research supports that people rarely keep their New Year's resolutions anyway. So instead, what I've done for the past 12 years is have a personal theme for the year, something to focus on, to think about, and maybe to help guide my behavior. For the past few years, my themes have been things like forgiveness, perseverance, and optimism. But for 2017, I'm taking a slightly different approach. Instead of focusing on kind of internal personality traits, I've decided that I want to focus on space. Now, not like space, the final frontier, but like physical and mental space. It has to do with simplifying life and creating empty spaces. You know, the idea that Things don't have to be crammed into a space, whether it's physical space or your brain. For years, my normal behavior has been to continually reorganize and declutter around my house. But over the years, I've found that 
I was spending a lot of money on organizational supplies like bins and little drawer dividers. And all I was really doing was packing more stuff into the same space, but I wasn't really decluttering or purging things that I didn't use. And I didn't like that every surface in my house had so many things sitting on it. My, my husband, John, has this philosophy, I call it John's first law, and that is where there is a flat surface, there will be stuff set on it. So the dresser in the bedroom, the work tables in my craft room, um, the kitchen counters, the coffee table, the bookshelves in the den, Everything was filled with vases, figurines, and just things sitting around. It became impossible to find a flat space to wrap a birthday present or pack up a box to send in the mail. So I recently went around the house and literally cleaned off most of the flat surfaces. In doing this, I asked myself, do I really love this thing? Like, do I love it more than the effort it takes to move it when I need to dust? And for the most part, the answer was no. So most of it, I donated to various charities or I'll be selling it at a yard sale in the spring. So yeah, now the surfaces in my bedroom, my craft room, the kitchen, the living room are all clean. Now there might be something like a lamp sitting on the end table, but there's a lot of open space and I really prefer the look of that. I don't feel deprived that I don't have stuff sitting all over. Unused space is not necessarily wasted space. I mean, when I go to a hotel room, it's so serene and calm, like a private retreat. And one thing that makes it feel that way is that the surfaces are, are clear. There's not stuff filling up every nook and cranny. So I realized it's okay to have empty space in your cabinets. It's okay to have empty space between the hangers in your closet. It's okay to have empty space on your calendar. So I'm also doing this on my calendar, leaving unscheduled space. I asked myself, does looking at my daily schedule make me smile or does it make me feel anxious? And for me, it was more anxiety provoking, worrying about getting everything done. So now I'm focusing on intentionally choosing how I want to spend my time. Yes, of course, I do have certain things that need to go on my calendar, like classes that I teach, meetings, office hours. But I really am making an effort to keep some empty space on my calendar and not have every moment of my day completely scheduled. Having empty space doesn't mean that I don't have anything of sentimental value. Of course I do. I have personal treasures in certain places and I do have some luxury items. I mean the idea of space and simplicity isn't supposed to be an exercise in suffering and giving up everything, for me anyway. So one of those indulgences is my yarn stash. And that was a careful and thoughtful decision that I made. I recently curated my yarn so that what is here is yarn that I will truly use. So how did I go about curating my yarn stash? Well, recently I completely went through every skein of yarn and even though it might not look like it to you, I considerably reduced the amount of yarn in my collection. So here's what I did. I put all the skeins into large bags that were easy to carry outside. I went out to my backyard and dumped out the skeins into a big blanket that I had put on my deck. They stayed out there for a few hours basking in the sunshine. I do this at least once a year for several reasons. One, to remind me of what yarn I have. Two, to inspire me. Three, to kind of dust off the yarn and four, to get rid of any pests that might be hanging out, although I've never found any evidence of that. Now, after the yarn airs out for a few hours, I open the hanks up and shake them out and brush them off. 
I do the same thing as much as possible with yarn balls and skeined up yarn and then I load them all back into bags, carry them back into the house. Now this time though, I also analyzed whether or not I wanted to bring each skein of yarn back into my stash. I asked myself, if I went to a yarn shop today, would this skein be something that I would buy? If the answer was yes, I kept it. If the answer was no, I got rid of it. And I did de-stash a lot of yarn. It was perfectly lovely yarn. It was just that I hadn't used it or didn't see myself using it. Some yarn I donated to charity and some I gave to friends who love it and will make something beautiful out of it. In thinking about my yarn stash within the theme of space, well, in curating my new stash, I really did free up a lot of space. My, my wire cubicles are not completely jammed full like they used to be. There's actually quite a bit of empty space that, to me, makes the yarn collection look better, and I can see more of what I have. So this is my personal theme for 2017, space. And I actually find that I rather like looking at and being in my living space when it's not so crowded with things. A couple of years ago, I recorded an episode of the U University audio podcast where I talked about the research on the psychology of clutter. So I wondered, what does the research on decluttering say? And does clutter really have a psychological effect on people? Well, there are actually a number of studies that have demonstrated the psychologically damaging effects of clutter in one's home. In, in America, clutter ranks in the top five sources of stressors in people's lives. Top five. Having a messy house was distracting and associated with not cleaning up after oneself. So people throwing wrappers on the floor, not doing the dishes, etc. Now, women specifically seem to be vulnerable to negative outcomes when they perceive their homes as unorganized. Uh, basically, the more stuff they have, the more stress women feel, and the more cortisol, a stress hormone, they have. Uh, the more dishes that are piled in the sink, the more anxious the women feel. Now, men, on the other hand, don't seem to be as bothered by messes. Now, several studies have found that having a clean and organized home is even linked with healthy eating, being physically active, and better overall health. So you might wonder, why do people hang on to things when keeping so much stuff around promotes stress and other negative outcomes? Well, a study at Yale University School of Medicine found that for many people, letting go of things literally causes physical pain. When some people try to declutter, they feel anxious, indecisive, and sad. And these emotions are associated with activity in the regions of the brain that are responsible for conflict and pain. These are the same brain regions that produce gut-wrenching cravings among smokers or drug addicts trying to quit. So for some people, decluttering is literally painful. And in order to feel safe and calm, it's easier for them to keep holding on to things. Now, some studies have found that merely touching an item can cause you to become more emotionally attached to it and thus less likely to get rid of it. So for example, participants in one study were willing to pay over 60% more for products that they touched and held compared to those who had just looked at the item. And you can see this in action if you've ever visited an Apple store. Everything in the Apple store is designed for you to touch and play with to make you feel like it's your own. And the psychological connection to things is what leads to the accumulation of stuff. Now, we know this from yarn shopping, right? We get attracted to the colors and the yarn aesthetic, and then when we fondle it, squish it, and rub it on our neck, we fall head over heels in love. 
And speaking of yarn, I thought I would show you some yarn and other crafty Christmas presents that I got either from other people or with money that I was given for Christmas. First, I wanted to show you a subscription yarn that I have uh, to the Plucky Knitter Classics. This is the December colorway called The Great Outdoors. This is uh, Primo Fingering in Superwash Merino Cashmere Nylon Blend. Um, I've had this subscription for probably two or three years now, and I absolutely love Plucky Yarn. Um, so this one is my subscription yarn from December. The second yarn is a ball of yarn that I got from a friend of mine in Belgium, and this is Lang Yarns Yavol Magic. It's a 75% superwash, 25% nylon blend, um, but just lovely, lovely variegated colors. Okay, this next yarn I got from my friend Devin, Francophile Knits, and it is on the Normandy base, 80% um, superwash merino, 20% nylon. Beautiful, beautiful base, and I absolutely love this colorway. It's the Fete de Hiver colorway. I am, don't speak French, so I'm sorry I probably butchered that. But anyway, love, love, love this color and this yarn. Lastly, I got two skeins of gorgeous yarn from my friend Jamie, Beautiful Mess Yarn Works, and this is the first one. And this one is the colorway Oak, and it is, again, 80% superwash merino, 20% nylon fingering weight. And the second one is a sparkly base, and it is in the colorway Rex. Love, love, love this color, too. So those are all the yarns that I got, and I will put links to all of these yarns in the description box below. I also got a beautiful box of fabric for a gift. It is called the Box of Fun, which is one yard cuts of 14 different K-facet prints. Ah, I don't know if I, can pan if I can put all these together, but here they are. Um, you've probably heard of Kay Facet before. He is an American textile artist and designer, well known for his quilting, fabric designs, and his knitwear designs. I love his fabric because he uses all kinds of flowers. I'm a big flower person, and you can get this box of fun on Craftsy, and I'll put a link below if you're interested in checking it out. Coincidentally, I also got another K-Facet product, and that is a set of hand creams, which he collaborated with Heathcote and Ivory on. The packaging on these is just beautiful, and the hand creams smell wonderful. I am a hand lotion junkie, and especially in the winter, and I've really enjoyed these. They smell flowery, and I like the scent. The only thing is that the fragrance in them is pretty strong, so if you're bothered by um, perfumes, you might want to stay away from these. Now, I know this set came from Ulta, but I saw that it's not available online anymore, so you might check your, your local Ulta store to see if it might be in stock, if you're interested. It looks like it's readily available in the UK, but I could only find one place in the US and I will link that below, but it's $28 for this set. And I think that it was $15 at Ulta when I looked. And the last gift I wanted to show you is this cute little journal called um, Rate Your Day. It is a three year journal and each page represents one day, like January 1st. And then it has three sections. So, you write the year, like this would be 2017, the next section would be 2018, the next section would be 2019. And you, so you just write in the year. Um, so each little section has three components. Um, first is a star rating, so you kind of rate your day on a scale from one to five stars. Then you put a headline that kind of, you know, what's your overall day been like? And then third, you can write about a sentence for the day. Now I really love this idea because you don't have to write 
so much. You only have to write one sentence for the day. You don't have to stress about filling up a whole page or writing about every detail of the day. Just one sentence only takes a minute to write down. And I also like the star rating system because John and I kind of already do that every night. We think back to the day we had and um, kind of give it a number. We've done that for several years. So it's kind of funny that they actually made a book that you do that in. And lastly, I like that it covers three years. So on any particular day, you can look back to what your day was like last year or like, oh, that was the day that that happened. You know, so this journal is really cool and it is under $20 and you can get it on Amazon and I'll put the link for that below. Okay, so as far as knitting, what have I been working on? Well, honestly, I have so many works in progress right now that I'm still in the process of sorting out and organizing everything after the new year. I, I'm sure I have at least five pairs of socks and several shawls on the needles as well. So I'm not going to show you everything today, but I thought I would um, show you kind of a fun project that I just finished. And it is a hat that I made out of DK weight yarn, um, two different DK weight yarns, and I striped them. You can kind of see the subtle stripes here. Now one yarn is Simplicity by Haiku is this yarn and it is white color number 001 and it is a superwash merino nylon blend and the other is called abracadabra by haiku that's this one and haiku is actually a scassel company they're the same company that makes addy turbo needles you might have seen this abracadabra yarn before. It came out a couple of years ago and it's the one that changes color in the sun. Um, this one that I'm that I used is natural to purple and it's color number 712. Um, it is superwash merino, polypropylene, and nylon. And I think the polypropylene is what makes it change colors in the sun. So I striped these two yarns and you can see they're pretty much the same color but not exactly so you can still see you know subtle striping. So when you wear the hat inside it looks like this just with subtle stripes but when you wear it outside that's when the abracadabra yarn turns to purple so then you have a purple and white striped hat. It's really fun and cool. So the pattern for this hat is one that I just made up. I cast on 100 stitches and I knit an inch and a half of 2x2 two two ribbing for the brim and then I switched to stockinette stitch um, until it was 7 inches from the cast on edge and then I started decreasing for the top. As I said, I did the stockinette in striping um, I did three row stripes, so I knit three rows of the Simplicity and three rows of the Abracadabra, and I just carried the yarn up the inside of the hat so I don't have to cut every single stripe and weave in all those ends. Oh, and I knit this hat on a pair of 16 inch Haya Haya circular needles in a US size 5, which is 3.75 millimeter. One thing that I want to include in each episode is a useful gadget that you might want to check out. I'm a total gadget person and I love trying out new things to see if they help me with my knitting or crafting in some way. Today's gadget is inexpensive and doesn't take up a lot of space and it's really simple but useful. It is the Clover Locking Stitch Markers with Clip. Now these are similar to the regular plastic locking stitch markers, but the clip on them is really neat because it allows you to attach notes to your knitting. So you can clip a little note to your project where you need to do an increase or a decrease, um, maybe just indicate a stitch count between two stitch markers, write yourself a note about the pattern, what row you left off on. I mean the possibilities are really endless as to what you can do with these. 
you simply slide the pointed end through your knitting, lock it in, and fasten a note in the clip. Or you can even attach it to the outside of a project bag with the name of the project on it so you remember what's in your bag. The set comes with six stitch markers and also includes a perforated pad for writing your notes on. They run only about five or six dollars and I just think these are super handy. If you're interested in purchasing them I will put a link in the description box below. And if you've already tried these, comment below and let me know what you thought of them. I am an audiobook fan and get books from Audible all the time. I enjoy listening to books when I'm driving to and from school, when I'm knitting or sewing, and I wanted to review one of the books that I recently finished. It's called The Last Days of Night by Graham Moore. This book is historical fiction, which is my favorite genre. And The Last Days of Night follows the bitter rivalry between Thomas Edison and George Westinghouse when the use of electricity and the light bulb were in their infancy. The year was 1888 and Edison and Westinghouse are fighting to control the electri electrification of America and to reap the wealth and glory that are sure to follow. So Edison is suing Westinghouse for one billion dollars in damages for patent infringement. And I'm sure you know Edison had patented a light bulb, but Westinghouse invented another one which he claimed was better. Now the whole story is told through the eyes of Westinghouse's untested 26-year-old attorney Paul Cravath who was hired to protect Westinghouse's growing empire from Edison's attack. Another inventor is also part of the story, the eccentric and often unstable Nikola Tesla. At this time Edison's electricity was the direct current or DC type. Unfortunately DC can only be transmitted over short distances so only people who could afford a private generator could have electricity in their house. But Tesla found a way to use alternating current or AC to overcome this limitation and thus revolutionize the spread of electricity. When Tesla went to work for Westinghouse, Edison set out to persuade the country that AC or alternating current was so dangerous that it could kill people. The novel follows the young attorney Paul Cravath as he crosses paths with, fig with figures such as Alexander Graham Bell, J.P. Morgan, and opera singer Agnes Huntington. Is he in over his head? The book reads like a legal thriller, but there are very few courtroom scenes. Instead, there is betrayal, attempted murder, propaganda, spies, secrets, deception. This story has it all. If you don't know this piece of history, and I did not, this is the way you want to learn about Westinghouse, Edison, and Tesla. It makes everything that happened with electricity and the light bulb memorable. The author definitely did his research and readers will walk away from the book feeling as, as informed as they are entertained. It's got to be one of the best works of historical fiction I've read. I enthusiastically give it five stars and the audiobook reader Jonathan McLean was excellent. He gets five stars too. Well, that brings us to the end of the show. I hope you enjoyed hearing a little bit about my personal theme this year of space. So do you have a personal theme this year? Are you interested in living more simply? Let me know in the comment section below. Also, please comment if you have any questions about today's show or if you have an idea for what you'd like to see on future episodes or if you'd like me to test out a product. Let me know. I'd love to hear from you. 
Thank you so much for spending some time with me today, and I'll see you in the next video. Next time I'll be talking about wool, and I'll be putting to the test some wool washes to see which ones work the best. I'll be doing some lab tests and sharing the results with you. I'm sure you won't want to miss that. In the meantime, have a sparkly week.